So, hi, um, my name is Amanda Clark. I'll be doing a presentation on uh, Virgil's influence on Berlioz's Les Troyons, and the subtitle Modern Life in Ancient Times is Portrayed Through Music. Louis Hector Berlioz and Publius Virgilius Maro, otherwise known as Virgil, are two of the most influential writers of their time. Berlioz and Virgil have many similarities, both in life and in compositions. Virgil's influence on Berlioz's work is strongly comparable between Berlioz's Les Troyons and Virgil's Aeneid, in which the Les Troyons is directly influenced in structure, language, and rhythm. Berlioz is a well-known composer, French composer, critic, and conductor from the 1800s known as the Romantic Era. He composed a wide variety of music, and he is greatly known for Symphony Fantastique, Romeo et Juliette, and La Domnition de Faust. Les Troyons is one of his most famous operatic works. In contrast, Virgil was a well-known poet between 70 and 19 BCE, known as the Augustan era. He is mainly recognized for his bucolics and his eclogues. The Aeneid is his most notable work. Virgil wrote the Aeneid during a period of major political and social change in Rome, when the Re Republic had fallen and Augustus had a Augustus had established an empire that he eventually went on to rule. Both Berlioz and Virgil's writing styles are similar for their most famous works because both works were constructed little by little and out of order. Les Troyons is Berlioz's third dramatic work and one of his last compositions. Because of being pressed for finances, both the music and the libretto for Les Troyons were written in a little less than two years, from May 1856 to April 15, 1858. While he was writing the composition, music was pouring out of him for several scenes at one time, out of sequence, while he steadily furnished up the lines, withdrawing foolish concessions to current taste and nourishing himself on Virgil. The opera consists of five acts, and it is based off of books one, two, and four of Virgil's Aeneid. Because Les Troyons ends after Dido's suicide, it would be unnecessary to compare Berlioz's work to any books of the Aeneid past book four. The Aeneid is Virgil's famous work, famous epic, and his last work. Virgil worked on the Aeneid for 11 years, but it still was not finished completely at the time of his death. Virgil first drafted the Aeneid in prose and then he divided it into 12 books, deciding to construct it bit by bit so that he could do each part as it seized his fancy, taking up nothing in order. Lest anything should impede his momentum, he would let certain things pass unfinished. Others he propped up, as it were, with lightweight verses, joking that they were placed there as struts to hold up the edifice until the solid columns arrived. After Berlioz finished the opera, he attempted to have it performed. After it was rejected by the opera in 1862, however, it was rejected by the opera in 1862. Because of the rejection of Berlioz's Les Troyons and the fear that no one would ever be able to hear it, he decided to divide it into two parts and make a piano reduction of the score. After the, redu after the rejection from the opera and dividing Les Troyons, the opera in its entirety was not performed until 30 years after Berlioz had passed. By dividing the opera into two parts, the structure becomes similar to the Aeneid, where it is made up of two separate but interlocking parts. The Aeneid itself is based upon Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and in fact, the first line of the Aeneid refers to both epics. Arma verumque cano, I sing of arms and of a man. The man refers to the Odyssey, and arms refer to the Iliad. Because Berlioz's Les Troyons structure is based off the Aeneid, acts one and two of the opera comprise Le Prise de Toy, and acts three through five make up Les Troyons au Carthage. Only Les Troyons au Carthage was performed in the Théâtre Lyrique, a smaller opera theater in Paris, France. The Aeneid was never finished, and it is uncertain whether there was editing done to it or not after Virgil's death. 
Before Virgil died, he had demanded that the poem be burned because he was not happy with the poem. But now the Aeneid is used all over the world as a literary, literary staple, and the Aeneid was kept alive once it was published because it gave readers the history of literature and political history. Politically, it gave both praise and critique to the, of the new emperor in a discreet manner. The Aeneid provides literature history because it pays respect to and challenges classical Greek literature and mythology by putting a Roman-like finish on the classics. Virgil was never able to see the great impact of his epic, and likewise, Berlioz was never able to see the first whole performance. And he was also never able to see the impact that it had on the audience. Berlioz, as a composer, faced similar challenges as Virgil, a poet. They had to adapt their text to either music or meter in a way that was pleasing and appealing to their audience. Berlioz's Les Troyons is not just a literary translation of the Aeneid, it is a musical translation. Les Troyons, parts of the text, in Les Troyons, parts of the text from Acts 1, 2, 4, and 5 are directly taken from the Aeneid. Not only the words are affected, but parts of the music mimic dactylic hexameter. Dactylic hexameter is the rhythmic scheme that is traditionally used in classical epic poetry, such as Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, Ovid's Metamorphoses, and the Aeneid. The meter consists up of lines made up of six poetic feet. Each dactylic foot is made up by one long vowel and two short vowels, as you see with the dash and the two U's. However, vowels can be long by nature, or they can be long by position, and this can result in a spondaic foot, where the two short vowels are replaced by one long vowel. Four of the six feet behave in this manner. The fifth foot is usually dactylic, but rarely can be found to be spondaic, and the six foot, it's just completely different. The last vowel in a line can either be long or short. This vowel is called an end caps. If the vowel is long and the last foot would be spondaic. If the last vowel is short, it would be called a troche because there is only one short vowel instead of two, like there is in a dactyl. The Aeneid is an unusual poem for classical antiquity because of the way the female characters are presented in the epic. Virgil portrays females in a way that seems to challenge traditional gender roles in Roman society because characters are both foreign and female. Most of the Roman literature is based on men and politics. Females were viewed as housewives and not leaders. Berlioz follows this example by using female characters to dominate the two halves of the opera. Cassandra dominates Les Tristes de Troy, and Dido dominates Les Troyons or Carthage. Aeneas links the two parts, but the second heroine remains after Aeneas's flight, concluding the epic in an individual tragedy that matches the collective tragedy of Troy's downfall. The character of Dido presents a challenge to the normal gender roles because of her scheming nature and her attempts to control a marriage that did not follow usual Roman traditions. Berlioz depicts the scene in the Aeneid where the manipulation takes place in a musical interlude at the end of Act 4, beginning of, at the end of Act 3, beginning of Act 4. Juno, queen of Goth the queen of the gods, has a grudge against Aeneas, and she sees Dido's love as a way to keep Aeneas from finding new land for Troy. Juno sets up a storm for the two leaders to be driven into a cave where the marriage takes place. Even though the marriage was not carried out following the usual traditions, Dido still views it as a conventional, conventional marriage and tries to keep Aeneas from leaving. If Aeneas would not leave her, her army would grow stronger with his men and she would gain more power and she would, to be, she would be able to have Aeneas forever in matrimony.
Act one of Les Troyons is based off of lines 13 through 249 of book two in the Aeneid. In this scene, the Trojans believe that the Greeks left after leaving a wo large wooden horse outside the gates of Troy as a gift offering to Pallas Athena, which is now known as the Trojan horse. Um, Laocoon, the Trojan priest, was skeptical and hurled a spear at the horse. And then two serpents came out of the sea and wrapped around Laocoon's two sons. And when Laocoon saw that and tried to save them, the serpents killed him too. The Trojans thought that this was Athena's punishment for harming the wooden horse. And despite the warnings of Laocoon, the Trojans brought the horse into the city. Even though this scene is in both works, it is written completely different between Berlioz and Virgil. Virgil wrote this scene as a recall from Aeneas' experience and has Aeneas tell it as a storyteller to Dido, who is the queen of Carthage. Berlioz, however, uses Aeneas and Cassandra to tell the story to the audience. Berlioz uses the scene as an opportunity to tell and to remind the audience of Cassandra's curse by having her tell her lover, Corbus that the wooden horse was a trick and that he did not believe her. This is because Cassandra was given the gift of prophecy by Apollo, but when Cassandra refused Apollo's advances, he spat into her mouth, making it so that no one would believe her prophecies. Act two of Les Troyons is an interesting act. In scene one of act two, Aeneas is awakened by the ghost of Hector, Cassandra's brother. Then Hector tells Aeneas that he is to leave and escape from the city of Troy and to find a new city for Troy. This scene is based on book two, lines 250 to 297, in which the speech that is written here um, is taken directly from lines 289 to 295. The music of this act could be influenced by the meter of the Aeneid. The opening line of Act Two, Scene One, is a dactylic line, created by the flute, oboes, and clarinets, while the rest of the instruments either tremolo or play the rhythm that is shown at the bottom of Figure One, which is on the screen now. The excerpt reflects the poetic meter because the line follows the pattern for dactylic hexameter. There is a long section, two short sections, and it follows this pattern until the very end where there's an end caps of one long, one short. Many measures later, there is another dactylic line. In measures 99 to 100, Aeneas says, Quel de l'or on flutri ton visage, what sorrows have ravaged your face. While this is being sung, the strings are emphasizing the dactylic meter by playing the a pianissimo tremolo. The tremolo is used to provide enough suspense in the section while not overpowering the dactylic line. In the music, the rhythm is long, short, short, long, short, short, long, short, short, long, short, following the pattern for dactylic hexameter. This line may be parallel to why do I see these wounds? But upon closer examination of the Latin, the line appears to be more spondaic than dactylic. So the rhythm is not entirely influenced by the text. In scene two, act, scene two, number 14, the Trojan women are surrounding the altar of Vesta Sibyl. Some women are kneeling and sitting and others have committed suicide on the steps of the altar. To set the tone of this song, Berlioz uses a surprising modal scale called a Locrian scale or mode. The Locrian mode is the scarcest mode used in the music of the Western Hemisphere, unless it's in jazz, because it is harsh sounding. In a normal minor scale, the third, sixth, and seventh scale degrees would be flatted. The Locrian mode, by comparison, has a flatted second, third, fifth, sixth, and seventh scale degree, which creates a tritone with a diminished fifth. 
Historically, the tritone is known as the devil's interval because the interval was often used to signal the existence of something sinister or desolate. While listening to the piece, the Locrian mode emphasizes and represents the despairing cries of the Trojan women. So in this excerpt, you see the cries, and I will be playing a YouTube clip for you all to hear. So. So this gives the example of the Locrian mode that he uses. And these are also the cries to Vesta. Now my favorite part of the opera. The Chasse Royale et Orage, the Royal Hunt and Storm, is the musical interlude between Acts 3 and 4, in which I mentioned earlier. According to Michael Austin of the, from the Hector Berlioz website, the Royal Hunt and Storm is solely based on book four, lines 117 to 168 of Virgil's Aeneid. In the Aeneid, Dido and Aeneas are preparing to go into the woods to hunt. Dido is delayed in her bridal chamber, and Aeneas sees his son, Ascanius, in the valley running with his horse because a terrible storm is arriving. A storm that is mixed with hail drives both Aeneas and Dido to the same cave. When they arrive at the cave, Juno, in cohorts with Venus, who is Aeneas's mother, initiated the wedding ceremony with heaven as a witness. At the end, the nymphs howled from the top of the mountain. So at the beginning of the hunt, Berlioz uses chromaticism to represent the peaceful streams before the storm. Then around measure 58, the strings are creating suspense, indicating that the storm is coming. And here's another YouTube clip. So that represents the chromaticism, well, shows the chromaticism that he had used. Um, 
How do I play some cards for? Oh. Okay, so that is a chromaticism. Now here, um, the terrible storm finally hits and begins at measure 79 with the strings doing like an upward pattern. Um, and Dido and Aeneas were married between measures 218 to 242 when the nymphs started singing. Berlioz portrayed the intensity of the storm accurately to what Virgil had intended. Virgil wrote, the sky begins to mix with a great murmur, follows immediately a round rain cloud with hail mixed in. Berlioz may have started the storm at 79, but it's not until measure 132 that hail is mixed in. He did this by using a sesquialtera or hemiola effect with the upper strings. This effect, to create this effect, the first violins and the violas play steady eighth notes and quarter notes, while the second violins are playing steady triplets. The triplets go against the eighth notes, creating the effect. So you heard with the, the fighting against the notes, that is the hemiola effect. Now, Act 5. Berlioz has a special attraction to Act 5 of Les Troyons, especially with scenes 2 and with 3. In Berlioz's memoirs, he says, How often, construing to my father the fourth book of the Aeneid, did I feel my heart swell and my voice falter and break. When I reached the scene in which Dido expires on the funeral pyre, my lips trembled and the words came with difficulty, indistinctly. I was seized with a nervous shuddering and stopped dead. I could not have read another word. The emotion that he felt while reading book four is the same emotion that he was able to put into scenes two and three of act five. However, it is important to mention that because the marriage of Dido and Aeneas was not done according to traditional customs and none of the proper rituals were performed, it was not a legal marriage or a um, a constitutal, constituted marriage. So when Jupiter, the king of the gods, sent Mercury, the messenger, down to remind Aeneas of the task at hand, Aeneas had no choice but to obey and abandon Dido, even though he loved her greatly. Act five, scenes two and three, are influenced by book four, lines 642 to 671 of Virgil's Aeneid. However, there are no noticeable influences on the music from the poem's meter. In Act 5, Scene 2, Number 47, Dido starts to go insane. With similarity to Dido's anger and madness in the Aeneid, she says, I'm going to die, drowned in my great grief, the grief unavenged, yet I must die. Could he but tremble when he sees from afar the gl glow of my funeral pyre? If any human feeling is left in his heart, perhaps he will weep at my pitiful fate. He weeps for me, Aeneas, Aeneas. Oh, my soul flies after you, chained to its love, and it bears down to everlasting night. Venus, give me back your son, futile prayer of a heart torn asunder to death devoted. Dido has nothing more to look for but death. 
The music in this section accentuates her madness by using a sequence of fast-paced, upward-moving eighth notes. For example, in measures 82 to 90, 83 to 92, Dido says, help me, inflame my heart with a burning hatred for this fugitive whom I loved. The music helps emphasize that she has anger towards Aeneas, only, but not only with the sequence of eighth notes, but also with eighth notes in stepwise motion. But instead of emphasizing her insanity, the next sequence stresses her despair and her sadness. Berlioz uses a series of minor seventh chords to get the sorrowful, sorrowful effect. In addition to the seventh chords, Berlioz composes Dido's solo to sound recognizably monotone most of the time. He does this by composing a still solo line full of stepwise motion with little to no disjunct motion. I will sing the solo. Du prêtre du pluton qu'on réclame l'office pour apaiser mes doloreux transport Alessand même en France un sacrifice à sombre déité de l'impère de mort. In Dido's monologue in number 50, the last words that she says before she stabs herself and the stage directions say, thus it is fitting to go down to the shades below she pulls the sword from the scabbard, stabs herself, and falls on the bed. This is taken directly from the Latin text of Book 4. Thus, thus, I please to go under the shades. May the cruel Trojan drain with his eyes from, the fire from this fire from the deep and bear with him the omens of our death. She had spoken, and between middle of such words, her companions behold her fallen on the sword, and the blade foaming with blood, and her hands sprinkled. Virgil influenced Berlioz's completion of Les Triomphes as well. On April 12, 1858, Berlioz completed and dated the final scene of the opera. Alongside the date, he added an exhortation from Virgil. Quid quitter rich superam domnis fortuna ferendest. Whatever will be, all fortune is overcome by enduring. Berlioz's use of the Aeneid in writing the Les Troyans brought another avenue of impact to the well known epic. He used the opera as another way for himself to influence other composers of the Romantic period with his ideas to continue the classical revival of the 19th century by putting classical literature into current, the current music of the time and by showing his different approach to orchestration, which is written in his instrument, instrumenta instrumentation treatise that he wrote in 1844. All in all, Virgil was very influential on Berlioz's life, as well as Le Troyon, by writing an epic that shows modern life in ancient times by following this common sequence of love, marriage, abandonment, and suicide. Thank you. <laughs>